It was a, a story that, that people were, were telling, it, one that had been a catastrophe ready to happen for the last seven years. Eventually, uh, of great magnitude, it would be four times the size of the Exxon Valdez. So that's kind of how we got to the current situation. When I first arrived in Yemen, people were talking about the vessel. I heard it first locally, uh, you know, everybody, uh, when I went to Hadeda the first time, which was very early after I arrived in March. It started when oil production began out of the Marab oil fields, which are in the eastern part of the country. It was North Yemen at that time. And they needed a way to get it offshore to sell, but they didn't have a place to store the oil on the coast uh, in the Port of Hudaydah area. So they bought this super tanker that can carry 3 million barrels of oil. And they brought it uh, into the Rasisa area of Hudaydah and anchored it to the pipeline that comes from the Marab oil fields in the, in the east. And then other uh, large carrier vessels would come in and pick it up, pick up oil from there and take it off to be sold. So that's how it was working from 1988 until the beginning of the conflict in 2015. After 2015, oil production uh, stopped, but also deliveries from that vessel to export stopped, leaving uh, over a million barrels there in the Rasisa area of Hudeda sitting there, and the vessel was not maintained for that since that time either, and the vessel's been slowly falling apart. The various systems that keep it safe and secure have basically ceased to function. Eventually, uh, of great magnitude, it would be four times the size of the Exxon Valdez. It would cost an estimated $20 billion for the cleanup. So it, it would affect fisheries, probably 200,000 fishing households would lose their livelihoods, probably for, for a generation. Uh, it would uh, contaminate the port of Hudeda, stopping shipping from coming in, including humanitarian assistance. It would likely spread to other parts of the Red Sea, particularly Eritrea, Djibouti, Somalia would be most at risk, Saudi Arabia at risk, uh, contaminating the, potentially their ports, contaminating the Red Sea proper, going into the Mbab el Mandab that leads into the Arabian Sea and is the primary exit for, for the traffic coming through the Suez Canal. Shipping could also be affected. Tourism would be affected and the pristine environment, this, this beautiful environment that we have in the Red Sea, also damaged at least for a generation. And 17, 18, up until the end of last year, the front lines of the uh, conflict between the recognized government and the uh, forces in Sana was at the edge of the city of, of Hudeda, in fact, at the edge of the airport there. And so it's quite close to the port and therefore was a security concern to the Sana authorities who controlled the area around the vessel. But since late last year, the recognized government forces actually withdrew further, much further south uh, to consolidate positions elsewhere. So that direct, immediate uh, front line no longer exists. So that has stabilized the security situation around the port of Hudeda, making our, our task actually easier. Of course, the recognized government in Aden uh, sees itself as a proper owner of the vessel because uh, they are the recognized government. In Sana, they also equally see themselves as the actual government. They're not recognized, but they see their self-perception is that they uh, are the government and therefore own the vessel. From the beginning, it was quite clear that the ownership issue was uh, complex and 
would likely take months or years to resolve. The decision we, we took was to recommend replacing the vessel with one that's not going to, to sink or explode and will be maintained so that the oil can be secured in an appropriate vessel while the larger legal issues are worked out uh, over time, legal and political issues, in fact. Well, there were many governments already, besides the, the two parties, that had expressed strong interest in this. And I have to say the, the Netherlands government in particular was very forward leaning on this. When we put together the, the initial plan and, and people believed, started to believe in the plan, they stepped forward to offer to organize a pledging event, which took place in May of this year. I think we raised almost $40 million in that event. And then we decided to expand it into two dimensions. One dimension was in the private sector, which was starting to get some results that would be useful to do a crowdfunding kind of uh, initiative as well. Crowdfunding, of course, anybody can contribute any amount of money that they wish. We were happy to find that there was a elementary school in Bethesda, Maryland, in the United States. They were able to raise, I think, a couple hundred dollars but they did this by selling lemonade and other fundraising things uh, that they did themselves. We raise money by selling lemonade and bendy pencils and mints. We made posters and talked about the possible oil spills. They came, in fact, when we uh, had the event with the General Assembly on the uh, episode Suffer, and we asked them to speak, and, and they spoke actually very well about why they were doing this and why they were interested, why they were committed. We have the, the funding. We hope to get some people on the ground in the, in the coming month to start the planning work for this. Now, the operation itself will last four months, two months approximately to prepare the vessel for the transfer, roughly a month or so to transfer the oil into a second vessel, and then another month approximately to clean up the old vessel so it can be sold for salvage. These are small pieces of good news. It's not a peace agreement, which would be the real good news, but you take what you can get and, and we are happy to help make a contribution to improve the welfare of people in Yemen.